All right, let's go to our Sunday school lesson right now. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to pick up our series in the book of Matthew. We took a break for one or two weeks, and I hope the things we discussed last week, I had an outline called Little Things Mean a Lot, about certain tiny little things, small letter words, uh, two or three letter words, punctuation marks in the Bible, in the text of the Bible that can make or break someone's interpretation. It can change the uh, view and the understanding completely. And uh, how cults have misread the Bible because they didn't understand all the nuances that, that are found in English or they wanted to believe something to start with. And so they find a verse to, they can, they can twist and force into that preconceived uh, idea and that hope. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 4, and we've read through verse 4. Here the Lord Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness. We read through four verses a couple of weeks ago, but verses 5 and 6 there say, Then the devil taketh him up into this holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. As I mentioned concerning the first temptation in verse 3, these uh, elements hint at the second advent, the second coming of Jesus Christ in some way or another, some proximity to it, but at the wrong time. Look forward at Matthew chapter 24. And verse 30, Matthew 24, verse 30, it says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And also Acts chapter 1. Acts Chapter 1, notice there verse 11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. The image or the picture of Christ ascending first, then descending as a ruling monarch, is clearly second advent in its nature. Um, even the temple is mentioned there. Look back at, uh, in, or rather in Matthew 4, look back just a couple of pages to Malachi 3, the end of your Old Testament, Malachi 3, and verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So the second advent um, hint, indication, all over the place, and uh, even there in the temptation of Christ. But in this temptation, Satan even quotes scripture at the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who is called the Word of God. You know, you cannot understand the Bible until you have a personal knowledge of Jesus Christ. And you will never have a full estimation or proper estimation of who Christ is until you read the Bible. They're dependent upon each other. And you cannot be a true believer in Christ and not consider what the Bible says about him. And nor can you be a good student of the Bible until you know him. They're connected uh, inseparably with each other. But in this temptation, Satan even quotes scripture back to the Lord Jesus Christ. So if he wouldn't hesitate to quote scripture back at the Lord Jesus, he won't hesitate to 
use scripture to deceive you if he thinks he can get away with it. You know, the tired, worn out, uh, often heard response, well, everyone quotes scripture, and who's to say you're right and someone else is wrong? They think they're right and you're wrong. Who knows the truth? Well, the way to answer that challenge is very simple. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. If you haven't got your nose in the Bible, regularly studying and reading and becoming more familiar with the, the language, the places, the people, and the wording of the verses you uh, read, then you're going to be easy pickings for the devil to come along and deceive you. You know, they say in banks that a teller just begins to learn to recognize real money from experience so that when a counterfeit comes along, they can spot it more quickly. I asked a teller this uh, about a year or two ago. I said, do you go to a school and are taught how to detect counterfeit bills? She said, no, you just begin to know your bills from working with it day after day. And so in a similar way, if you are reading the Bible and you become more familiar with the Bible, you commit scripture to memory and you, more, uh, you are more acquainted with the people and the places and the stories and the events and the things predicted in the word of God and the miracles of Christ and the things said by Christ, the things said and written by the apostles and the Old Testament prophets, then you're going to easily spot a phony. You're going to easily spot somebody who is making it up as they go. I go to a particular Catholic church uh, through, my, through the course of my day job in the funeral home, and uh, of course a priest will sprinkle holy water on the casket to bless the remains, uh, supposedly uh, the remains of the person as we go in and out of church. And his words are always the same. I bless the body of so-and-so with the holy water in which Jesus says, Thou art my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. First of all, he's making it up for the benefit of the people because he knows they don't know anything about the scripture. Jesus never said that to anybody. He certainly never said it to a, a woman in the Bible, or a man. Uh, the Lord God said that of Christ. The guy's wrong in three counts. But he knows his people are completely ignorant of the Bible, so he makes it up on the spot. Doesn't matter if it was a young person that passed, an old person that passed, man, woman. According to him, Christ said the same thing to, the same, to, to everybody. And nobody knows the difference. But see when you have been spending time reading the Bible and you know what the Bible says and what it doesn't say, then you can spot a false teacher, you can spot a, a false idea, a false argument without much difficulty. That's why the Word of God is so important. But if Satan wouldn't hesitate to quote the Bible back to the Lord Jesus, hoping to trip him up, why would he fear you? just because you tuck in your love gift and send it to TBN, or you speak in tongues, or some such thing. What makes you the super Christian that can withstand the attacks of Satan, you know? Those TV preachers that always say, ah, Satan, I come against you, I bind you in Jesus' name. How long are you going to bind him for? Till the end of the program? For the week? For just the weekend? You know, to the end of the conference? How long are you going to bind him for? It... It's dramatic enough, it gets the attention of the ignorant, but uh, you shouldn't be ignorant. Like there's a number of places in the Bible that said, I would not have you to be ignorant. So you counter that idea that, well, everyone's quoting scripture with the idea that, with the command, study to show thyself approved unto God. So the more you, time you spend in the word of God, the less likely you are to be fooled. Every heresy involves one of three um, aspects. Number one, taking words out of a verse or out of a text, only partially 
quoting it to prove something or another. Uh, look at verse 6 here. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Compare that with the text he's citing back in Psalm um, 91. Psalm 91. Psalm 91 and verse, verses 11 and 12. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Satan left out the phrase, to keep thee in all thy ways. Don't partially quote a verse or half quote it or purposely leave something out. If so, then you're trying to deceive somebody when you're suggesting something uh, completely out of, the, out of the blue. That's not based on sound doctrine from the Word of God. So there is the sin of taking something out of a verse. You recall in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, God says, said, Of all the trees of the garden thou mayest freely eat, and then when Eve quoted it to Satan, she said, we may eat of all the trees of the garden. She forgot the word freely. She took out a word. The first sin ever committed by any mortal man was to subtract from the words of God. It was Eve uh, taking out the word freely from the way God had given it to man. You know, the grace of God is such a marvelous thing, and I'm, I've been saved 52 years, and I'm still now just, I'm still learning how all encompassing the saving grace of God is. God lets you get away with things and do things and say things and think things and conduct and behave yourself in so many ways, contrary to the perfection of God. It doesn't strike you down on the spot. That's because of his grace. He gives you another day to live. He gives you another day to breathe. He gives you another day to, for your heart to keep beating and another day to be strong and healthy and go about your business. He doesn't strike you down on the spot. Giving you another day to live is his grace. Not striking you down is his mercy. Yes. Grace and mercy go hand in hand with each other. Yes. But his grace day after day, when you think of all the things you did before you became a true believer. And when I was a little boy, six years old, I got saved. And so I have to say this, and it, it doesn't sound good, but it's nevertheless the truth. Most of the sinning or I ever did, I did as a saved person growing up after that. Either before or after you get saved, you think the things you did and you tried to do or got away with and things you wouldn't want your wife or your children or your parents to find out about or your friends at work to find out, things that you would be ashamed of. And God doesn't strike you down. That's so much mercy. Gives you another chance to repent, start over again. That's his grace. And uh, it's, it's so broad and covers so many things. And thank the Lord for it. But, um, and so Eve left off a word, thou mayest freely eat. She left off the word freely. You can freely eat of all the trees of the garden, except the one, except the one. There was no restriction on how much of the fruit of the other trees they could eat. No limitation. But there was one tree forbidden. So, if Adam wanted to be a glutton on fruit, fruits and vegetables, I guess he could have been a glutton. There was no restriction on that, no limitations on that. But taking words out of God's book to teach something that may not be true. And then secondly, the second way heresies are formed are by adding words to the scripture that aren't there. Adding something that's not there. Look at Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs 30. 
And notice there verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 30 and verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So you don't want to add anything to the words of God. Don't say the Bible says something when it doesn't say it. The Seventh-day Adventists will say that God commanded the Sabbath to be observed in Genesis 2 when he first rested from his creation. He did not. There is nothing in Genesis 2 uh, where God commanded anybody to rest and observe the seventh day. Just because he did, didn't say that he commanded everybody else to do it. In fact, he didn't, observe, he didn't command any resting on the seventh day until Exodus 16, and then made it official in the law in Exodus 20. 2,000 years of time transpired from the creation uh, and the, the man being put in the garden until God told them to rest on the seventh day, Exodus chapter 16 to 20. 2,000 years. That's one-third of the Bible's history unfolded without anybody knowing anything about resting on the seventh day. Nothing. The Roman Catholic Church says that Christ was making Simon Peter the first pope. They add to the scriptures. They add their own interpretation to the scriptures. And uh, the third way heresies are formed is by taking the text out of its immediate context to make it mean something that it doesn't mean. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. We talked about one of these last time. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And notice there verse 29. This is one the Mormons make. By taking something, uh, ignoring the immediate context, and saying it means something entirely different. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? A Mormon says, see, you have to get baptized on behalf of your ancestors who died long before you were born, or long before Christ came along, and give them a chance in the great beyond to hear the gospel of Christ. But the context of 1 Corinthians 15 is not the dead who died before you. The context is the resurrection of Jesus Christ and your hope of resurrection because you're trusting in Jesus Christ. It's in anticipation of future resurrection. Look uh, there in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, <clears throat> verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, future tense, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also vain. And then he says there in verse, um, and then of course verse 29, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Paul's, the whole context of 1 Corinthians 15 is the fact that Christ rose from the dead and you as a believer in Christ expect to rise from the dead in the future. When you and I are baptized in water, we are picturing, we're uh, prefiguring a, a future event when these bodies come to life again. We're illustrating that in a very simple practice of water baptism. Water baptism doesn't save anybody. It's a testimony that you are saved and you are anticipating some great resurrection one day when Christ calls for you at the rapture, and the catching away of the saints. It has nothing to do with people who died before. It's in anticipation of future resurrection. That's what the context, that's what the meaning of verse 29 is, the anticipation of future resurrection. See, the Mormons didn't understand that the little word for, F-O-R, goes two directions. It's either for, on behalf of those in the past, or for, in anticipation of something in the future. Remember I used the illustration of paying for your meal? 
that fast food, you pay for it in anticipation of eating it. In a nice restaurant, you pay for it after you've eaten it. See, the Mormons, they pushed the little word for into the past when they should have pushed it to the future in anticipation of a future resurrection. And the Charismatics, they pushed uh, for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, into the future, and they should have been pushed to the past. In light of past remissions, what should our response to God be? So they take it out of its immediate context. Go to John chapter 6. I'll show you another great example. John 6. John 6, and let me begin there. <clears throat> Verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. <coughs> the Roman Catholic Church says, we take the scriptures literally. All these Bible um, Christians say they believe in the literal scripture. We take it literally to mean this is his flesh. When the priest holds up the wafer and the wine, he consecrates them and turns that bread into the human flesh of Jesus and that wine into the human blood of Jesus. They're not just symbols any longer. This is his flesh. This is his blood. That's called the, the miracle of transubstantiation, changing the substance. They say we take the scriptures literally, uh, and the so-called fundamentalist take it, uh, don't take it literally where they should. But look at the context of John 6, verse 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. The way you eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood is by coming to him and believing. It's a matter of faith. Christ said to the woman at the well, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There in, in John 4, verse 24. It's a matter of faith. It's a spiritual exercise, a spiritual relationship you have between you and God. You come to him by faith and believe that's how you eat and drink his body and blood. He says in verse 57, as the living Father uh, hath sent me and I live by the Father, even so he that eateth my flesh, uh, even he shall live by me and so forth. Is there anybody stupid enough to think the way Jesus Christ had fellowship with the Heavenly Father was by turning bread into his flesh and eating God's flesh? No. But Jesus says, this is how you and I will have fellowship, the same way I have fellowship with my Father. It's a spiritual fellowship that can only come about by coming to Christ and believing. You see, they take something out of its context and force it to mean what they want it to mean. The old Alexander Hislop's book, The Two Babylons, published around 19... 15, 19, 20, along in there. Uh, he described the, the word cannibal, Ka'ana Baal, a priest of Baal in ancient Egypt. And by derivation, we have the English word cannibal, someone who eats flesh. And the priest of Baal made loaves of bread and said magic words over them and pretended to turn that into the flesh of their God. And this is how they got their God in them, by eating it. And so, like I say, the, the word for literal eating of flesh, cannibal, was derived from that. And that's, in effect, what goes on um, in Roman Catholic Mass, is the pretense of eating flesh and drinking blood. They're just, they, God just conveniently made them taste like wine and taste like bread uh, for the sake of those who will take it. And I said the best argument against that to show you that uh, even Roman Catholics don't believe it is by saying 
Let's suppose that this really is human flesh. Let's suppose that it really is human blood. Who wants to stick that in your mouth? You have any good sense? If it tasted like, if it smelt and tasted like blood, or tasted like human flesh, with that decaying odor coming on it, who would want to put that in your mouth? Nobody. So God uh, conveniently makes it taste like, you know, wine and cookies, wine and wafers for people. Well, let's push it all the way and say, would you really want to put that in your mouth if you thought it was someone's human body? If you have any sanity about you, you'd say no. It was figurative. It was a, a metaphor. It was a figure of speech to describe his eating, uh, coming and believing. So there's two cases where someone has added something to the scripture, or they've taken it out of its obvious context. And then verse uh, 7, back in our text, verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. What a, what a rebuke to Satan in light of verse 1. Look at what he said in verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And as I said, if Satan wouldn't hesitate to tempt Christ, the second person of the Godhead, the one who made all of the creation, if he wouldn't hesitate to, te to tempt him, what makes you think you're special? How are you going to conquer and vanquish the temptations of Satan? Because you are a devoted prayer partner, and you tuck in your love gift and send it to TBN every month. Uh, somehow that's going to protect you from the attempts of Satan to distract you and tempt you and to destroy you. Satan's very bold. Satan's very brave. And he won't hesitate to come against a child of God, especially one that's weak, one who hasn't been spending time uh, by the Holy Ghost in prayer and in the Word of God. And all three times in this passage, the Lord Jesus answers Satan from the Mosaic Law. Deuteronomy 6, 13, Deuteronomy 6, 16, and Deuteronomy 8, verse 3 are the three texts he cites in his three answers to Satan in this part of the Bible. Verses 8 and 9. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The high mountain is not identified, but it's not, it certainly wasn't high enough. There's no mountain there uh, in Israel high enough from which Christ could see every continent and every nation in the world at one time. Uh, it wasn't necessary. In Luke's account, Luke 4, verse 5, he said he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So there was some, something supernatural about the vision Satan showed to Christ. One didn't have to be seeing it all, all literally with physical eyes. That couldn't have been done. And the offer Satan made to the Lord Jesus was a bona fide offer, but the timetable was wrong once again. Look, look forward at Revelation 11. Revelation 11, book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 15. And the seven angels sounded, and there was, excuse me, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord, and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So Christ will eventually take rightful possession of all the kingdoms of this world. Not just the kingdom of, kingdoms of men, but there are other kingdoms as well. Think of the kingdoms of rocks and minerals. There are the kingdoms uh, of uh, plants and animals. Those things are referred to as kingdoms very often. And we might even add the stars uh, in the night sky throughout the universe and all the galaxies are sometimes referred to as kingdoms of one sort or another. In Matthew chapter 4, Christ was looking towards a cross, not yet a crown. 
So Satan had these things offered to Christ, but in the wrong time period, in the wrong timetable. Satan is said to be the god of this world, and he wants to be worshipped. Satan's primary sphere of operation is religious. He wants to be worshipped. Now, he may be in charge of the liquor traffic, he be, may be in charge of the prostitution, drug, and gambling problems in the world, and he certainly delights when people's homes are broken up, and he delights to see uh, countries uh, destroy themselves through one policy or another, and undoubtedly he's behind the, the nonsense and the distractions of the modern, of modern man, you know, let's worry about climate change and global warming and picking up your, you know, and banning plastic drinking straws and all of those things. Let's worry about, undoubtedly he's behind that nonsense, but his primary sphere of operation is religious. Satan wants to be worshipped. As I said in our church hour, there are only two forms of belief in the world. There is the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then there's everything else. All of that is uh, controlled by Satan, inspired by Satan, directed by Satan, influenced by Satan, led by Satan in some cases, like the Church of Satan. They don't, they're not shy about it at all. Look, at, uh, look forward at Luke's account, Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, notice there verse 6. <clears throat> Luke 4, verse 6. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Go forward to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, notice verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And also Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Notice there verse 14. Hebrews 2 verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood... He also himself likewise took part of the same, that's Christ. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Satan is the god of this world. Satan has the power of death. Satan has uh, the power of destruction. And uh, he wants to be worshipped. But you have to temper that also with Job chapters 1 and 2. He's only allowed what God permits. Satan doesn't have carte blanche, unlimited, unrestricted, unhindered uh, power uh, without God's ability to stop him. But he has some permitted to him. There's a great contest waging in the world, the unseen world and, and the world in which you and I live, between the influence of the Holy Spirit and the desire of God to save sinners if they'll turn to him, and the influence of Satan to distract sinners by appealing to their flesh, by appealing to their, their uh, egos in one way or the other, so they are interested in this subject to the neglect of their soul. They get sidetracked onto some other issue and pursue it down a dead-end street and miss the main thoroughfare uh, on the way to heaven. But um, anyone who doesn't see that Satan is behind the powers of this world and the governments of this world and the religious uh, influences and the religious powers uh, in the world is setting themselves up to be deceived. Notice James chapter 1, not far from there, James 1 and verse 13. James 1 verse 13, it says there, 
Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God in his pure essence cannot be tempted. But Satan tried to tempt God in the flesh when his, when his flesh was weak. He, after 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was unhungry, the Bible says. He tried to tempt him in his weakness. Of course, he failed at that too. Thank the Lord he failed. You know, thank the Lord that the Lord Jesus Christ, being hungry after 40 days without eating, was still able to be, uh, to, to, uh, be victorious over Satan's temptations. And I mentioned to you a few weeks ago when we began this, that in the uh, alleged story of the Buddha, they say the Buddha sat under a Bodhi tree for some accounts say one week, some accounts say one day, others say he sat under there under the tree for 40 days and uh, said, I'm not going to rise until pure enlightenment finally overtakes me. And during that time of temptation and uh, solitude, isolation, he wasn't eating, wasn't drinking anything. He sat there waiting for enlightenment or knowledge about the universe to come to him. And uh, during that time, a demon named Mara appealed to his flesh in three different ways. It mimics the story of Christ. It mimics the temptation of Christ recounted in uh, Matthew 4 and Luke chapter 4. It's a cheap knockoff. The story, uh, the, the legend of the Buddha, the Buddha never existed. There's no reliable evidence that any person as Siddhartha Gautama ever even existed. It was a legendary tale. Uh, it supposedly took place in India, but the Indian people didn't accept it. They held on to their Hinduism. And then it migrated into China by between, 50, between the time of Christ and 100 AD. But the Apostle Thomas went as far away as India preaching Jesus Christ, we, by the best records, as early as 40 AD. And from there went into China. And, and the story of Buddhism uh, the story of the Buddha wasn't even be beginning to take hold among the people to about 400 AD. By that time, the gospel of Christ was already being preached in India. The gospel of Jesus Christ began taking a, a hold in India before Buddhism even went to, uh, not China, went to China. But we assume that... Uh, you ever notice that the legend of the Buddha, the story of the Buddha, and the imagery, the statues, and the artwork of the Buddha has a, a far eastern uh, Asiatic look to the face? If it came from India, he should have more of an Indo-European look, like Indian people resemble. You see, that you know the facial differences between Indian people and, say, someone from China and even Korea, no disrespect to you, <laughs> and brother from, tai from Taiwan. But the story of the Buddha is all a myth. He never existed. It was originated as a cheap knockoff to compete with the gospel of Christ, taking, uh, which had already reached that part of the world from the Savior in Palestine. We need a hero of our own people. This is how Catholicism gets a foothold in every country. They say the virgin of so-and-so appeared in Vietnam. The virgin of so-and-so appeared in France. She appeared in Mexico. She appeared in New York State. She appeared in Portugal. They have some vision that supposedly takes place among the locals, and all the locals, oh, wait, we have one of our own to believe in. That was largely the, the origins of the story of Buddhism. If the Buddha lived 550 to 600 BC, why is it that the first official biographies of him weren't written until 180? nearly 600 years after his supposed lifetime before the first written records given that, that are accepted were written down, were recorded. There's a whole lot of time for mythology and legend to creep into the narrative over those centuries. And if he lived 550 BC, that was still 450 years after the time of Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived outside 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's a lot in the so-called wisdom taught by the Buddhist monks about the life of Buddha and great things he supposedly said that were simply borrowed from the story of Solomon. It's a cheap knockoff. I mean, aren't the uh, communists in China now knocking off toys and products and purses and things at the mall? They're, they're the best, the best, some of the best copycat knockoffs are coming from China right now. <laughs> well, they started by imitating the story of Jesus with the legend of the Buddha. The Lord, the Lord Jesus was born in a manger. There was no room for him in the inn. The story of the Buddha was that his mother gave birth under a bunch of trees outdoors because there were, she went into labor on the way back to her homeland. So that part of his birth matches. Uh, his mother saw a vision of a, a white elephant flying out of the sky with six tusks coming out of its mouth, and the elephant entered into her side, and the baby came out of her side, and so he was miraculously conceived. That matches the story of the virgin birth. Uh, and there are a number, number of particulars that match the story of Christ closely enough that you can see it was a copycat, a knockoff. And so they had to predate it, say, well, this happened 500 years before the time of Christ. But there's no evidence of anything like that happening before Christ. The first records of it weren't recorded until after Christ. It's sort of like... Joseph Smith saying all these great prophecies the Book of Mormon anticipated, but all of the prophecies the Book of Mormon supposedly had anticipated had already taken place when Joseph Smith sat down to write the Book of Mormon. This is a clever yeah. manipulation, make you think that this ancient book had foreseen future events, but even those future events had taken place before Joseph Smith sat down to write the Book of Mormon. So if you're not paying attention, someone's pulling the wool over your eyes and All right, let me move on. I went down a, a side road. Let me get back on the main highway here, everybody. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I want to move along for time's sake and bring this to a con conclusion soon here. 1 John chapter 2. Notice there verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. All three of these elements are found in, were found in, with Eve in the garden, Genesis, the book of Genesis, and they're also found with Satan tempting Christ in the wilderness. Uh, she saw a tree that was good for food, and he said, command that these stones be made bread. That's the lust of the flesh. Um, a tree to be desired to make one wise. He said to Christ, jump off the temple. <laughs> Prove that you can do it. That was the pride of life. And then it was pleasant to the eyes for food. Uh, and he said he would give him all the kingdoms of the world. In Matthew 4, that was the lust of the eyes. So the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All three of those elements were present, not only in Satan tempting the woman in the garden, but Satan trying to tempt Christ in the wilderness. And verse 10 in our text, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That's from Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. In this contest, Jesus confirmed his deity by being victorious over Satan, and he confirmed his sinlessness as a man. He had two natures, the nature of God and the nature of man, together. This is how God bridges that, that gulf, that divide between himself and his creation, by coming into the creation itself, being born as a man, living among men, walking among men, so he can identify with men. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.15 that he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, thank the Lord. So God can say, I understand what you're going through. I know what it is to be tempted because of the Lord Jesus Christ. He now can identify with your plight and mine. And uh, at Calvary, he testified to his 
ultimate victory. Let me read to you a verse. You don't need to turn. But uh, Colossians chapter 2, Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And he confirmed uh, his deity. He testified to his deity uh, on the cross of Calvary and was victorious over sin and, of course, proved his deity by rising again after three days and nights. And then lastly, verse 11, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Hebrews 1, verse 14 asks, Are they not, our angels, are they not all ministering spirits? Yes, they are. And uh, Psalm 34, verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. Go, if you will, to Luke chapter 22, and we'll finish for today. Luke 22. Luke 22, and here Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he was betrayed and crucified the next day. Luke 22, notice there verses 43 and 44. <clears throat> Luke 22, verses 43 and 44, especially verse 43. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The so-called best manuscripts, Vat Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, which the Catholic Church uses to base all their translations, and most of the modern Bibles rely upon for their translations, those supposedly best manuscripts do not have verses 43 and 44 in them. And so you pick up most of the new versions of the Bible, and they'll have brackets around those two verses, or a footnote suggesting that the best manuscripts or the earliest manuscripts don't have verses 43 and 44 in them. Well, all that makes it to be is an eternal guessing game. Do the verses belong or don't they belong? See, the King James Bible assumed that they belonged, and they didn't load it down with footnotes to second guess what they had written or explaining what, what it might mean in another context or another universe, they put the words of God down there and gave it to God. The King James text doesn't rely upon a multitude of footnotes to support itself, but all the modern translations do. It's funny, you look at the New King James Version, and time and time and time again, you'll see a footnote at a verse, you look down and it says, literally, this means, and then they'll quote what the old King James actually says. Well, if the old King James uh, is what it literally meant, why did you change it? Why did you change it to start with? Exactly. The love of money is the root of all evil. All right. Luke 22, verse 43, that verse is not even found in the so-called best manuscripts, and therefore it's missing from some modern translations, and the others have footnotes saying that they probably don't belong. And all it makes it to be is an eternal guessing game, button, button, who's got the button? Uh, you say, you're right, he says he's right, I think I'm right, what if we're all wrong, and so forth. You and I, as Bible believers, we take this very seriously. We believe every word in the Bible that we hold is there by the direction and the providence of God. Yes. And therefore, it's not our, our job to second-guess it or to say it doesn't belong or it should have been worded differently, to take something out or to add something to it, accept it and believe it as it, as it stands in front of you and trust the Holy Spirit to teach it to you. That's His job. Your job is to believe it. It's His job to teach it to you as you go.